Good morning, everybody. My name's Ian. I'm director of design at Instagram. But fun fact about me, uh, Instagram is actually my side gig. My main job is to raise four little children with my wife out in California. And I'm actually from New York. I'm from New Rochelle, New York, uh, which is just above the city, which is also the hometown of the rap group, group uh, Brand Nubian. Don't know if anyone is a Brand Nubian fan. I'm aging myself, I know, but thank you, my people. Appreciate it. All right, so uh, the, this morning's been about how to fix design. And um, I have a pretty good range of experiences, actually. So I started uh, about nine years ago uh, working on Nike at RGA, which is based in, uh, in New York City, and uh, got to work on a range of experiences around the digital sport tracking. So the first run tracking stuff to uh, Fuel Band, and then left RGA to go to uh, Foursquare to lead the design team there, then took my whole family out to California to work at YouTube, and over the past two years, uh, been building the team at Instagram. So when I think about how to fix design, my mind goes to this relationship between design and data, this constant conversation that's happening. Now, this is not a new topic. It's been kind of a hot button thing for the past few years, but it's one that I think is only going to become more relevant over time, particularly as businesses become very data driven in their decision making. So when I reflect on experiences like working for a brand like Nike, which is very design driven, they've got a CEO who is a designer, right? They're known for designing great products. Or a YouTube, which is a lot more data driven, but is on track to eclipse TV viewing uh, when it comes to video watch time. Both of these companies are very success, uh, successful, but you know, they, the, I think there's things you can learn from both and try to create a hybrid model, which is sort of what I try to do in my work. So usually when we talk about design and data, you get this dichotomy, uh, which kind of plays out something like this. So design is very considered to be subjective, whereas data objective. Design is about intuition, whereas data is about facts. Design can be about art or more associated with art, whereas data associated with science. Design is about feelings, data about statistics. Design is about puppies and all that's good in the world, and <laughs> data is about politicians. <laughs> so I'm playing to some stereotypes here, but there are real tensions that do play themselves out on a daily basis, at least in, certainly in my world. But I think there's real magic to be found in connecting intuition with statistics or with art and science. And no matter what you're designing, whether you're designing new theme park experiences or maybe working on an autonomous car experience or thinking about how to respond to market trends in fashion and get new product out into stores quickly, or you're in architecture, at this point, data is a part of the conversation. So I think it's really important for designers to think how they can uh, kind of refine their toolbox in this new world. So when I think about more of the, the data-driven environments that I've worked in, a couple of thoughts come to mind. So first is data that lies. And by this, I don't mean that people use data to lie. That does happen. But more frequently, what happens is, in my world at least, you might launch a new feature and you see a graph move, right? Now, half the time, that's because there's some logging error. But there's also some times when you've actually changed behavior. But when you look a little bit deeper, you see that you maybe only changed behavior for one particular audience, and you might have had an adverse effect on another. The point is that it takes a lot of time and rigor to unpack and understand what the data is really telling you. And even once you do that, you may not really know why it happened, and you certainly don't know how you've made people feel with the changes you've made. On the flip side, data does keep you honest. When you're designing for 700 million people, like we do at Instagram, you've got to have some really healthy feedback mechanisms to help you understand if you're really on track, if you're really trying to make the experience better. Right? And in the best cases, data can inspire. It can help you unearth new opportunities, new problems to be solved. Um, or it can actually really help you find the right constraints to be creative within. But in the end, data is not going to save you. You can't A-B test your way to a product vision. You're going to have to take some creative leaps, which may have more to do with intuition than with something more scientific. So where does this leave us? Well, I like to take inspiration from industries that have nothing to do uh, with mine, you know, different kind of creative disciplines that I can learn from that are pretty disconnected from what I do every day. 
So the past couple of years, I've been thinking a lot about the world of comedy. So about three years ago, I started um, listening to the WTF podcast. Anyone listen to WTF podcast? Show of hands. Okay. Really good. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. It's, it's gotten really big. He interviewed Obama recently, or not so recently. But um, uh, about three years ago when it started, uh, I started listening to Mark Marin, who's a, he's been a comic for a long time. He has lots of friends who are comedians. So he was able to bring them into his garage and have these really personal, in-depth conversations uh, with comedians and talk about their evolution, both from a craft perspective, how they've evolved their comedic voice, all the way up to how their career evolved over time. And so it's really insightful, enjoyable interviews. But what I started to find is there was a lot of crossover or overlap between the comedic development process and the design development process. So to get into this, I want to introduce you to uh, my, my current favorite comedian. You hear about the cheese factory in France that blew up? There was debris everywhere. <laughs> So that's my son, Leo. He's actually not a very good comedian yet. But he's learning to tell jokes. And so it's been really interesting to, to help him, or to observe him, uh, start to work through the idea of comedic timing and setting up jokes the right way uh, and, and kind of like learn the craft of it. A master of this, uh, arguably, is, is Jerry Seinfeld. And so I want to play a, a, a clip from a New York Times interview they did where uh, they allowed him to break down one of his jokes. The joke is about Pop-Tarts, but he goes into depth in terms of how he weaves together language to make the joke land well. It was the 60s and we had toast. We had orange juice that was frozen years in advance that you had to hack away at with a knife to get a couple of drops and it felt like you were committing a murder before you got on your school bus. So in the midst of that dark and hopeless moment, the Pop-Tart suddenly appeared in the supermarket and we just stared at it like an alien spacecraft and we were like, we were like uh, chimps in the dirt playing with sticks. What makes that joke is you got chimps, dirt, playing, and sticks. In seven words, four of them are funny. Chimps, chimps are funny. <laughs> then there's the trying to figure out as a kid, how did they know that there would be a need for a frosted fruit filled heatable rectangle in the same shape as the box it comes in and with the same nutrition as the box it comes in. In the midst of that darkness and hopelessness, the Kellogg's Pop-Tart appears and they always laugh there because that indicates, oh, he's telling us a story. And then my next joke that I want to get to is chimps in the dirt with sticks. So now I'm looking for the connective tissue that gives me that really tight, smooth link, like a, like a jigsaw puzzle link. And if it's too long, if it's just a split second too long, you will shave letters off of words. You count syllables, you know, to get it just, it's more like songwriting. So it's interesting, right? It should probably sound familiar to designers in the room to think about you know, just trying to get the details right, to get things to just line up perfectly, right? So much intentionality and craft that's going into one joke. And it's particularly impressive given the humble beginnings of most comedians. You know, you're, you're just someone who thinks they're funny, who's getting up in front of a group of strangers to let, make them laugh for a couple minutes, kind of like what I'm doing now. But they, but as the, over time, they, they get used to getting up in front of a group of people and they start to learn how to piece together a bit, right? And they start to figure out the craft. This is uh, comedian Hannibal Burris, who's more established, talking a little bit about um, his early days as a stand-up. Do you still enjoy performing comedy in clubs? Yeah, I, was, I did the Comedy Cellar last night. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the, yeah, I like doing comedy. See, I don't perform as much as I did when mm -hmm. I, you know, in my mid-20s while I was trying to go up and do, you know, 15, 20 sets in a night, but, the vibe is still fun, and then just to, you know, share your ideas immediately. Like, you know, I could come up with something today and then go to the comedy club and try it and see if it works. If it doesn't work, shift it. If it does work, you know, try it at another show. Mm -hmm. And if you could build an entire bit over the course of the night. So it's just a, a very gratifying uh, art form for that, just to, you know, get good ideas out. So he's getting up 15 to 20 times a night, and probably half of them bombing, working on one joke. 
And so it's a very familiar process to me, because when we do design work, it's very familiar, whether you're iterating internally, doing critiques, or you're putting something out there to see if people actually use it. But in the comedic world, yeah, over time, you learn to, to put together jokes. And you learn to get up in front of larger and larger audiences. Larger and audiences. And if um, you're, you're good, those audiences start to come to you. They start to uh, know what your comedy is about, and they look forward to coming to a show. And so you might call this a type of like product market fit, right? You're finding your audience. Sometimes you even get exposed to uh, new audiences off the back of others. So Louis C.K. used to open up for uh, Jerry Seinfeld and had to learn new skills. And in these larger venues, this is often um, where we see like the comedy specials, right? And um, Chris Rock says it takes him about 200 shows before he gets to that hour of comedy. And the whole time, he's going to these clubs and bombing, right? You know, he's, he's doing the same process all stand-ups do on the road to building this hour of comedy that he can then sell to an HBO or a Netflix. So the metric the whole time that they're optimizing for is laughs. They're trying to make more people laugh more often. But the good comedians start to make or find a difference between good laughs and bad laughs. They start to get really good at making people laugh, but they get really picky about what laughs they're actually going for, which is a, kind of another level of craft. This is Louis C.K. just talking about uh, bits that he leaves out of his acts. I start deciding, what am I going to stop doing? There are bits that I got to through tech, technician work and through survival instinct that I don't believe in. I've had bits that kill, and I get rid of them. There you go. Because, because I, I, I just realizing that, that I have had that But then you agree thought. with me. And I think, I think this bit. Two against two. This bit is. Two against two. <laughs> this bit Come is on. working because I know how to do stand up. It's not working because it's something that's important to me and, and uh, yeah. I don't need it. So he's talking about principle, right? You know, getting to the point where you have these operating principles that help you determine what stays in and what stays out. And when you think about some of the most successful comedians, they're defined not only by the jokes they do tell, but perhaps to a greater extent, the jokes that they leave out, the ones that they don't. So this idea of differentiating via the principles that you set up, I think, is an important concept. So the, again, the metric is laughs, but the real goal is this emotional connection, some sort of emotional resonance. And I think these principles also help you get closer to uh, the, the specific emotional resonance you're looking for. Now, this is particularly relevant for some work we've been doing at Instagram recently. Uh, we started playing in this face filter space, these AR things that you put in your face before you take a selfie. And um, in our creative development process, of course, we got into like, the details on how to make a cute koala, right? You know, and get the fur right, and those sorts of things. But quickly it became clear that we need to actually just focus on whether it made people laugh, right? Whether it was fun to kind of put on. And so we went through a very similar process of trying things, figuring out whether the ears are flipping enough or in the right times, et cetera, and doing that across, same sort of iterative process across a number of, of, of different uh, face filters to try to just get the feel right, right? To, to make it feel like something that you'd want to share with folks. And I think this is only going to be a more prevalent sort of creative challenge for designers. When you think about other kind of emerging technologies, whether it's AR, VR, or it's voice UI, or those sorts of things, these platforms are going to reach a certain level of maturity, uh, and they'll have a certain amount of utility. But to be able to differentiate, you're going to have to come up with a point of view or a personality. Right? And that's going to take a, a different sort of skill set. You're going to have to optimize for this kind of emotional connection. And so ultimately, I think when you're thinking about working with data and design, I think you still have to hold on to those creative muscles. Right? You still have to make those strong. But you also need to develop some really strong working principles as an organization which really help guide how you're going to measure those creative decisions, right? what data you're actually going to pay attention to to ultimately make an emotional connection. So in the end, maybe to fix design, designers just need to become better comedians. <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm.